One, two, one, two. G'day, Dylan from the Byron Bay Observatory here. An open question for you guys, because active optics is not something I actually know much about, so I want to ask my audience. What do you think? Not to be confused with adaptive optics. You might have seen those telescope shots uh, on professional observatories with mountains pointing a laser up to the sky. They use the laser and the interference from the laser to detect the very slight, what would you call them? perturbations of the atmosphere in order to create high frequency corrections to the optics and with these big observatories those corrections happen really intra the mirror so the mirror itself will deform with little actuators which will then correct for the atmospheric turbulence above the telescope. Now, I love that idea. I love looking at these telescopes. They look like spaceships with laser guns. I loved it so much that I sort of replicated it myself for a uh, laser finder scope early on in the days of this channel. But adaptive optics like that were initially marketed at consumers like you and I, the lower level observatories and telescope users, but it wasn't really adaptive optics. And some people got confused because active optics is a bit different. Active optics is really what we have access to at this level. I apologize if I sound a bit croaky, I'm coming down with something right now. And they also cut the power off to my house. So um, I've only got the battery in this camera to get me through. But let's talk about active optics. Did we actually need it in 2024? My name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. Active optics, I feel like, was more popular in the years preceding when I got into astronomy, which was about 10 years ago. And now we don't really hear a lot about these products. And why is that? The promise of active optics is sharper images. And it achieves this by making very minor adjustments to your guiding when it sees that the guide star has left the centroid. And instead of waiting a longer period, which is what PhD2 guiding or any other guiding would do, wait for a second, two seconds, three seconds, and then make that correction, it makes it at a higher frequency, sometimes 10 times a second, sometimes 50 times a second, but quicker than traditional guiding would do. And it makes these corrections by physically tilting the sensor, I believe. And by making these small tilt adjustments, your guiding error will be reduced, sometimes by 0.3 arc seconds or 0.5 arc seconds or more. And the consequence of those small corrections at a rapid frequency should, in theory, equal a better image. But that process of making small high frequency corrections to the guide star really just sounds to me like guiding with extra steps. That just sounds like guiding with extra steps. And to be clear, this is not correcting atmospheric distortion or atmospheric perturbations, which is something that adaptive optics promises to do. Active optics, on the other hand, what is it actually correcting? Well, it turns out what it's really correcting for are small imperfections in the mount. No mount is perfect, whether it's a strain wave mount or an equatorial mount, a really expensive one, a guider, they all have mechanical error. They all have a small amount measured in arc seconds, where as the gears rotate, as the belts turn, uh, it's not gonna hold that star in 100% in place. And so by sending these small high frequency adjustments to the guiding, you can then smooth out those errors and then in theory, your image should be clearer. So it would stand to reason that this sort of correction makes more of a difference for long focal lengths like mine rather than wide field astronomy. And in fact, some of the before and afters I've seen from people who actually use active optics don't seem to have a measurable improvement on their images. So that got me thinking. This year, 2024, we have pretty good mounts these days. I have a pretty good mount in the observatory. And if the promise of active optics is to get sharper images by reducing that RMS error in your guiding, I feel like I can reduce that error already in my guiding by making sure my telescope is well balanced in the first place and really well polar aligned. And if I hyper tune by going over and over my polar alignment, my star alignment, my multi-point model, I can drag that total RMS error down quite dramatically. Not to mention in this day and age of improved deconvolution and AI deconvolution, at the end of the day, will the final image have a noticeable improvement with active optics than without? 
If you look at the atmospheric disturbances, say on a video of the moon, uh, you'll also find that these atmospheric disturbances happen at all points over the field of view. And that's why active optics is not correcting for this. The frequency at which you'd need to be making adjustments is in the order of 1000 times a second at least, 1000 Hertz. But also the imperfections happen anywhere in the field of view. Simply tilting the whole field of view won't actually correct for any of it. So my question to active optics users, people who have experience with this stuff, if you look at a rig like mine, where I'm using a very sturdy high payload mount and I have a high focal length, which is something that active optics should be good to do, is it worth investing in an active optics module? There aren't very many dealers who make these things these days. I feel like they've gone out of popularity a bit. And is this why they've gone out of popularity? Is the difference really negligible these days? Or is it something that we should do if we are chasing the perfect pixels as we are wont to do? It would be nice if we had real adaptive optics, even on consumer telescopes, even on the expensive end of consumer telescopes. I feel like they're not necessary with things like the RASA and wide field setups, but for the long focal length setups, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything bridging the market. There are very expensive setups you can get for professional observatories that do do true adaptive optics that correct for the atmosphere. But typically at my level, uh, it's more active optics sort of modules that you can get. And is it worth messing around with the back focal distance or swapping out your off axis guiding and going AO instead? Uh, what are the pros and cons? Has anyone used both? And can you give me any advice? I'd love to know if active optics is worth it. Leave your comments down below. And if you haven't read my comment section, uh, I learn the most from the comment section, which is why I'm making this video and asking the question of you guys, some of the people who have experience in this stuff. I reached out to Rowan, who I recently mentioned, and he gave me a bit of feedback on his unit as well. And I checked with other people on the Discord server. And the overall general opinion, especially on cloudy nights and forums like that, is that active optics is doing nothing for atmosphere, doing everything for correcting the mount. And if you have a really, really good mountain setup, maybe the effect is negligible. So what do you think? My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you've been watching Star Stuff. And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. 24 hours later. Bro, this is how low my voice gets when I'm sick. I feel like I'm the lowest bass singer in the world. Uh... <laughs> <coughs>take a moment to talk to you about this channel cringe mid my kids don't respect me they won't respect me until i reach a hundred thousand subscribers on this channel and get the silver play button so please like and subscribe i stepped up i, stepped up. Right. I smiled